Genesee Valley Chapter of the Adirondack Mountain Club. Uh, my name is Bill Lindenfels, I'm the chapter chair. It's great to see such a big crowd out, especially in, in January. Uh, luckily, we didn't try and, and hold this meeting three or four days ago. I bet we would have had far fewer people here. Uh, it's great to see such a, a nice big crowd here tonight. Um, first of all, I did notice back out at the membership sign-in that seemed to be quite a few people here tonight who are either new members or who are guests. Uh, would you mind just raising your hands so we can get to see who you are and maybe members who are nearby could introduce themselves and, uh, and welcome these folks to, uh, to our meeting and to our club. That would be great. Um, we have, uh, well first of all, I wanted to say something a little bit about uh, the pictures you're seeing right here. Uh, these were uh, sent to me uh, by a chapter member, uh, Serge Losa, who uh, has uh, decided in his, well I'm not sure if he's just decided or in his 70s now, or has been doing this for a while. But he's in his 70s, and that's him doing this ice climbing right here, okay? So, uh, if that's not an inspiration to the rest of us, as to the kinds of things that you can do at all points in your life, I don't know what it is. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed the pictures. <laughs> no, <laughs> this, is not the, this is not the, maybe this is the ET this time of year. But, uh, okay, fine. I think we have a, uh, a few announcements right here. Uh, Carol Quinn is going to talk to us it's a little bit more about Quest, I think. Uh, enough about Quest. No, I'm here to talk about the, uh, the Outdoor Expo. It's never too early. Uh, we're going to be celebrating our 21st Outdoor Expo this year. That's the one that we hold at Menden Ponds. And it, this year it is going to be Saturday, June 8th. 9.30 to 3.30, so, uh, excuse me, it's, what day, <laughs> which day, the 9th, they're saying the 10th, take the average, it's the 9th, I was a statistics major, so I know what that answer is, <laughs> okay, sorry about that, it's the 9th, and uh, that's where we have uh, over 60 workshops on hiking, canoeing, kayaking, backpacking, bicycling, uh, you name it, they've got it. And representatives from a lot of different outdoor clubs and organizations. So we hope you'll think about attending. And we'll also hope uh, that if you did have a real good time last year, and maybe you'd like to help out this year, uh, we do have a planning committee that's been working on this already for a few months, but we can always use some more help. If you are interested in that, please check the website uh, under the, uh, the Outdoor Expo and there is a phone number or an uh, email that you can uh, send a, a note to and ask if you know, maybe there's something that you can do. And then, I'm also the, the volunteer coordinator for the land uh, activities and I'll be getting back to you in a couple months to get some people signed up. We usually need about 60 people the day of the Expo to help out with various volunteer activities. It's like a two hour time slot. So uh, there is a link on the website that you can send a note to me and I'll get back to you. Or I, like I said, usually in the next couple meetings we'll uh, have some sign up sheets for that. And Barb uh, has an announcement in regards to the expo as well. So along the lines of the expo, uh, the committee has an idea for a new workshop this and it's a, a workshop about where people can rent equipment. So we'd like to have a workshop for where people can rent equipment for backpacking and rent equipment for paddling. So we're wondering if there is um, someone out in the audience here who'd be interested in presenting one of those workshops. Uh, it would entail doing some research to find out what vendors in the area have equipment, uh, how much it would cost to rent, how long you can rent it, and then do a workshop on it at the expo to help people know where they can rent uh, the equipment. So people, we want to help people get started in the area before they have the opportunity to go out and buy equipment. So if you're interested in doing one of those workshops for us, please catch me at the end of the meeting or uh, uh, give Rich, uh, drop him an email. His email is in the agenda 
to see it, and we'd love to have you join us to do a presentation. You know, just building on what uh, Carol and Barb just said right here, obviously this is an organization that runs on volunteer labor, um, and uh, we can always use help from various people. I really love to encourage everyone <laughs> to consider contributing in some way or other. There are lots of opportunities uh, to do various uh, things within the chapter right here. Certainly Expo is a great example of that. But beyond that, there is lady trips. If you've got a favorite hike, or maybe a favorite paddle, or maybe a favorite place to go cross-country skiing, uh, it would be great if you were willing to step up and lead a trip, for example. And certainly there are many, many other activities within the chapter that, uh, that depend upon folks like yourselves in order to keep the chapter life. So please consider doing that. Um, yeah. I'm Steve Tryon. I am back and being webmaster. So, trying to catch up and clean up and so on and so forth. Take a look at it. If you see something that's wrong, broken, out of date, whatever, please tell me. If I don't know it's broken, I can't fix it. And I'm trying to work especially hard at targeting things for handheld devices, cell phones as well. If there are pages that just don't work, Please tell me, because the uh, email address is at the bottom of the page. Every page. Thank you. Uh, you know, speaking of things uh, having to do with uh, uh, information technology and the like, uh, I was going through the roster of our chapter members uh, a week or so ago, and uh, you know, we've got that's a big chapter. For those of you who don't know, the third largest within the club. We've got something like around 1,200 households, okay, with something larger than that by the way of voting members. A uh, large group of people, but the surprising thing is that uh, out of that, we have a few hundred people for whom we really don't have any contact information. And if you're somebody who's not been getting anything from us, I mean, like not a paper genesean, not uh, any emails of any kind from the club or from the chapter, uh, please contact me, okay? This is something that you might want to consider is connecting with the club and finding out about all the great things that happen. Charlie? Hey everybody, I'm a water wage care person. I know it sounds rather strange with five degree and negative numbers, but um, we just had our water wage holiday party this past Saturday. And we had 23 brave people come out from sub-zero countries. We had all. Um, we have a waterways planning that we scheduled for February 22nd. And that's when we can start planning our adventures for the year. Typically, February's got the right year. We start paddling towards the end of March, early April. And we'll go right into December. So come join us. Thanks. Jack Schrader. A couple of items. Uh, first, this weekend, Sunday, uh, Winterfest, sponsored by Monroe County, down at Menden Commons Park. If we get enough snow, the temperature is pretty good, please stop by. What we are doing, ADK, is ADK, it's a guy show. We're trying to run a snowshoe club. In the past couple of years, we've asked volunteers, we've asked any of you who have a snowshoe to come and uh, deposit them with us. And then we illustrate the families who come by, what it's like to wear snowshoes, what it's like to walk in snowshoes. Three, four, five years ago, we would rent snowshoes from EMS. Last two years, there's no snow, so we didn't rent 
No chapter meeting would be complete without <clears throat> Jackson Thomas and his bookstore and his ever famous raffle. Take it away, guys. Hi, everybody! Hi. If you were here last month, who was, by the way? Well, you probably remember that I promoted ADK's. I almost begged you to buy one because I was expecting a problem once we hit January with leftover calendars. And for most of the past 26 years that I've been guiding the bookstore in this annual event that I play with calendars, I managed to sell all the calendars I purchased and the club has continued to make up a small little profit which goes into our coffers to help with many of the activities and programs that we sponsor for all of you. This year, I have 13 calendars left over, which is the most ever. Naturally, when we get to January, I drop the price to induce you to buy one. So for the princely sum of only $8, you too may have an ADK calendar. Perhaps you need one for a gift. Perhaps you forgot to buy one for that back bathroom. <laughs> Who knows where this may land? But more importantly, as many of these as I sell tonight are on this remaining 13, that will reduce the slight loss that we're going to take on what I've already paid to purchase the three dozen calendars with which I started in October. So, I guess I'm begging you, if you need a calendar for $8, come over and see me after the program, please, and I'll tuck one in your pocket and you can take it home and give it a good home. So, can I charge you? I wish you could, Chad. Okay. But, you know, uh, charge it in terms of getting it next time, or getting it after you see me. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, you don't know what your eyes are. She's so honest, she closed her eyes. Thank you. Mike Schaefer. Over there.
you might help us to bring families to this program. We have three speakers next month who will be talking about family adventures and how to make them happen. We've made a flyer on this program. Uh, they are people who adventure, two, two men who adventure with their families and have been educating their kids so that they can take them up the mountain or canoe across the lake or whatever the adventure is that they'd like to do. But they're, they're having success with it and they would like to share their adventures and some tips on equipment, how to, how to convince your kids to keep going the miles. Um, and so my uh, invitation to you is if you know a family who you think might enjoy this program, to please take a flyer from me tonight and take it to the family. I mean, families are very busy with all the activities that their kids do, and it's hard for them to know when this stuff takes place. This is happening on Valentine's Day, but they could bring the family. The workshop that night is a beginning of the, the first of the Map and Compass workshops, and it's a family-friendly workshop as well. So families could enjoy both events that night, and I have great information here for you to share with them. So please see me if you would like a flyer to share with the family that you know. And then tonight, I'd like to introduce Jamie Marsden. We are lucky enough to know her because our secretary for the executive committee, Sarah Sopransky, who's a wonderful volunteer in the club. She's not here tonight because she unfortunately has the flu. But Sarah, a couple years ago, took a wilderness first aid class. And in that class, she met Jamie preparing to do the Appalachian Trail hike. And Sarah was all over that. She wanted to know if she could follow Jamie's plot. She followed her and then um, told us about her this fall, when we were, or this summer, when we wanted to plan some programs and said, maybe I know someone who might be willing to come here. And so Sarah has arranged for Jamie to come and talk to you tonight. She is a physical therapist and even had the opportunity to use her skills on the trail a little bit. And she's got many stories to tell you. I will let her come. Please welcome Jamie Marston. Um, the one on the right 
right is me, when I was seven, bundled up like an Eskimo, because we were about to traverse out to 80, 90 mile an hour winds above tree line. That's another adventure for another time. I did survive. Um, that's a picture of my dad and myself on the left hand side there. Another little hiking adventure. So I never really thought, you know, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to have the opportunity to do the trail or not. But uh, yeah, these are more pictures of me when I was seven. Um, it did become my dream to do the trail. So it had been my dad's, and hearing all these stories, then it became my dream, especially after I did Mount Washington. That's what really ignited it. So year after year, I dreamed of hiking, hiking the Appalachian Trail, and I really refused to let go of this dream. Um, my time finally came when approximately three to four years ago, I um, got into a doctorate program for physical therapy, which meant in three years' time, I would graduate, I would take my terrible board exams, and then I would have a chunk of time where I would be looking for a job. Hmm, looking for a job. That time I might not have one. I might have a chunk of time I can actually go out and hike. So there was my opportunity. Now, I didn't want to go it alone, so I needed to find somebody to go with. So one day I was with a friend of mine in the car, and <coughs> telling her about this dream, I really want to do this, and she said, you know, I think I have someone that has the same concept. Oh, really? Turns out it was my old soccer teammate from college that she was talking about. So I called this person instantly, and she was down. So we, we got it together, we did a lot of planning. I can talk hours about planning. Um, let's just say, you know, the maps that were poured over, the research that was done, the people I talked to, the books that I read, the social media sites I got on, I, the, the preparing of meals, which is what you see here. Um, let's just say three years later, later I was packed and ready to go. <laughs> I studied hard. I took my board exams on June 20th, 2016. On June 21st, the car was loaded with my best friend who was sitting all the way in the back, I did see you. Um, and my trail mate to be, we packed up the car, we said a very sorrowful goodbye to my significant other, my PDs and my mom. And uh, we were off to meet. I must say my trail mates, or my uh, classmates thought I was crazy for doing a 12 hour drive the day after I took my board exams, but. So on July 21st, we drove to me. And this is where the adventure begins. So, my dad planned to meet us in uh, Maine. So I started in Maine and worked my way to Georgia. That's how I did this trip. Um, I do have to say that for some reason, when I was looking at that map that I just told you about at my dad's house, um, I always looked at it as if it was from Maine to Georgia. I don't know why, but I think I was just destined to be a southbounder. But uh, my dad did meet us there. We spent our first night as uh, soon-to-be hikers at the Appalachian Trail uh, Lodge. Uh, yep. And uh, the next morning we woke up and we had breakfast at the AT Cafe. Now as we were eating breakfast in this cafe, in walks this grungy, smelly, thin, frail looking individual. And he comes up and at this cafe they took the ceiling panels down. And they would have completed through like their sign, the ceiling panels. And he walks up and he grabs a pen and he signs. And I watched him and I thought to myself, wow, that's going to be us in a few months. And uh, I got to know him. His, his trail name was Spoon. Um, I never found out why his trail name was Spoon, but that was his trail name. So let me take a break there and explain a couple things really quickly. Um, <laughs> so first of all, uh, I just said trail name. His trail name is Spoon. What kind of name is Spoon? And wait a minute. The presentation said take an adventure with Dory. Who's Dory? All right. Well. On the Appalachian Trail, for those who don't know, you don't really use your real name for some reason. Um, I don't know if it's because there's so many Johns and Julies out there or whatever, but typically speaking, what happens is you either pick a trail name for yourself, which some people do do, or you allow the trail to determine the name for you, which sometimes can be quite embarrassing. Um, I did meet someone whose trail name was Faceplant, so you can imagine how they got that name. Um, and I will tell you how I got my trail name a little bit later. Now, I mentioned before that I was destined to be a southbounder. What on earth does that mean? So, northbounders, we're going to start there. So I recognize that there's one in the crowd here today, which was excellent to meet her. Um, so northbounders, there's about five or 6,000 that start every year. They're people that start in Georgia and work their way to Maine. Um, so, yeah, they're also known as Novos, for short. Southbounders do the opposite. They start in Maine and work their way to Georgia. 
There's about five or 600 each year that go to South Congress, quite a significant less amount. There's another term called a flip-flopper. There's even less of these. These are people that will start in one location, head a direction, stop for whatever reason, drive to the other part, and head back down and end at a separate location. The typical way to flip-flop would be to start in Georgia, stop in um, Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, which is the psychological halfway point on the trail, drive up to Maine, and then go down south to Harpers Ferry and end there. I did meet some people that started in Georgia, made it to Glasgow, Virginia, stopped there, went up to Connecticut, continued north to Maine, stopped there, drove back to Connecticut, and then ended in Glasgow. So there's a variety of flip-flops that are out there, but um, and any reason can be you know, finances, weather, um, family events, um, trying to find hikers, trying to avoid hikers. There's lots of different reasons to do a flip-flop. So after our first meal, we were off, and we're heading into Baxter State Park, which is where Todd and lies. Um, so my dad paid for our meal, so he became our first trail angel, uh, along with my best friend who got us there in the first place. Those were my first two trail angels. Now trail angel, what on earth is that? This is someone that provides transportation, lodging, food to a hiker. Many times these random act of kindness can be something that helps that hiker keep going when you hit rock bottom. Um, we were very lucky to experience a lot of help from trail angels along the whole way of the trip. Uh, these are people that um, really are fantastic people, and I, I'm proud to say my, my father and my best friend were some of the first two trail angels I got to experience. So off we started, it's on the basic time. So on day one, when we got into Baxter State Park, we got there about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, it takes a while to get in there. And we were going to start up to the top of the Appalachian Trail. Now I say up because the traverse to the top of Katahdin doesn't count. It's you start at the top and you make your way down. So unless you're going to helicopter out, you got to get up there first. Um, so we ran into a friend of mine who happened to be there as a college buddy of mine who was there with his family, and he met us and he said, you know, ran into some rangers today and. Uh, they said there's a storm rolling into town and they want everybody off the mountain bike too. So this is where the adventure begins. It was 10 o'clock in the morning, for those of you that might have lost track of that. We gotta be done by two. This is a 5,000, let me see, 5,268 foot mountain. I got a little amount of time to get up and down there. So I've, I've grown up hiking Mount Washington in the whites. I know bad weather, I know how to read the clouds, I know how to tell when the storm's coming in, thank God. We did start up the trail. We decided that once we got to Treeline, we would reevaluate. So we got to Treeline. One, I do have to say, one thing I learned on the Appalachian Trail was, um, actually I learned in hiking in general, the mountain will always be there. If the weather conditions are horrible, if the weather's not helping, if you're sick, anything, don't attempt it. Do not become that statistic. Wait, it will be there the next day. So we had this thought in our mind the whole time we were on the Appalachian Trail to make those wise decisions to not push it. So that being said, when we got to Treeline, I did a quick surveillance of everything, and we were looking like we were doing pretty good as far as weather was concerned. Mother Nature was going to bless us and allow us passage to the top of time. So off we went. Um, we summited Katahdin, the 5,268-foot mountain at 2.49 p.m. So there I am, hugging the sign, because this is the beginning of my dream. This is the beginning of my dream and my dad's dream. The views up there were absolutely stunning. Ah, you can't really see the ball in this picture, but that's kind of what it started to look like. <laughs> we took our pictures and we said, you know, it's time to head down. There's about a one to two mile period of time coming down from Todd where it's relatively flat, but it's all above tree line. And then it goes down. So as we're making our traverse across, um, I started looking at the weather again, and I'm watching some clouds rolling in, and I'm going, hey, we gotta get down pretty quick here. So we picked up the pace, and we start down our traverse, and just as we're coming down these rock boulders, now let me explain these rock boulders to you. There was one moment in particular I remember where I had to reach down below me for the rebar, wiggle myself around, release myself up, and let go. And that's how I got down the boulder. I actually didn't touch the level below me. I had to 
of drop to the level of 180. I'm not a particularly tall individual, but this is still relatively steep. So as we're making our way down this, this steep descent, all of a sudden, kaboom, on the next mountain ridge. Thunderclap. We, we picked up the pace a little bit and made it down to the base of the mountain. <laughs> Um, we did get down without any water actually whatsoever, and we completed our first day as southbound or through bikers. Um, that night, I had my second encounter with a trail angel. It was actually my buddy from college. He planned on making us a spaghetti dinner for a surprise, which was nice. And this is where the trail angel started to show up. So he was chatting with me about some college days, trying to reminisce, and you know, one story after the next. You remember this? You know, Jamie, you remember this? You remember that? Nope. Uh, nope, I remember that one either. <laughs> no, no, that happened? But, so he jokingly said to me, you know, your, your trail name should be short term. <laughs> short term? Huh. So, all right, I thought about that. Now, backstory, I'm an ice hockey player, I've had a lot of concussions. That's where that comes from. So at any rate, just throw that one in the back of your mind a little bit. So the next day we started off. Now, I started carrying about 60 pounds in my pack. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> um, you notice that um, this is broken into Act 1 and Act 2, and the reason being is the year that I think I can encounter some of the worst conditions that at least I've been told that the Southbounders have come across, um, one of which being an extreme cold that we got in Southern Virginia, um, which forced all of us off trail. So we had, I did end up having to take a couple months off and come back because of that, and I'll get to that later. But that's why you see an act one here. Um, so I started with 60 pounds. I was able to get it down on day two to 55 pounds. And then <laughs> from there all the way south, I would carry anywhere from about 38 to 55 pounds. Um, 38 was kind of more towards the tail end. Don't ask me how I did that. So from this point forward, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to kind of highlight to the best of my ability each state. Now, I, like I said, there's there's so much to tell. It's going to be really hard. I'm going to try to get through this. We spent about a month in Maine. So day one, one of the hardest parts of the trail was Katahdin. Check. Done. Day three was the 100-mile wilderness. Now, the 100-mile wilderness is 100 miles of trail that is supposedly secluded. Now, there are roads that come in and out of the so if God forbid something happens, you're technically not um, easy to get to. Um, it's also where there's no town in between those two points, so anything that what we call a resupply, where you're trying to get food, is limited. Um, I'm not going to get into this, but we did discover there were two resupply options in the 100 mile wilderness that we were not aware of until we left. So we carried 11 days worth of food for the 100 mile wilderness. Um, the third a challenging part was Southern Maine. So as I started as a Southbounder, I kept crossing Northbounders every single day, and every time, they, all they would say, oh, Southern Maine, look out for Southern Maine. Oh my gosh, wait till we get to Southern Maine. Apparently the terrain there is pretty bad. So we were, we were yet to figure that one out. I do have to say the 100 mile wilderness was one of the most packed places on the entire Appalachian Trail. We had Boy Scouts troops, Girl Scout troops, we had college outings, we had weekenders, we had 100 milers, we had northbounders, we had a few southbounders here and there. We were anything but secluded. But it was absolutely stunning. So, day three, we made it through our toughest, uh, one of the other hard parts in Maine, the 100 mile wilderness. And uh, I just want to share this little gem. Oh. There we go. I don't know if you can all see this. So, one day, I'm going up. And uh, I stop and take a water break, and I look to my left. There's something white in the middle of that. What is that? It's a Dalmatian. <laughs> it's a statue of a Dalmatian. I'm in the, I'm in the middle of my wilderness. We're not accessible. Somebody brought that in and put that there. And thank God I took a picture, because every single night where I talked to, nobody ever saw that. They all would have thought I was crazy, but I have proof. It's there. <laughs> So within the first week, we started to deal with blisters. Um, I don't know how many of you have hiked and dealt with blisters, but let me let me offer a piece of advice. Moleskin, burn it. It makes things worse. Duct tape doesn't work too great either. But I gotta tell you, um, I did cross a northbounder who became a trail angel for me, and he told me about something called leuco tape. 
Leukotape works. If you want to know how, I can explain that one later, but remember that one. Leukotape works. Now, short little video, this could be why we had problems with uh, blisters. Let's see if this will work. Right after the shelter, 
and there were thunderstorms rolling through. So at the risk of dodging lightning bolts, we decided to wait for better weather. However, we couldn't wait there forever, so we did start making our way through some foggy scenarios like this. Um, and uh, Mother Nature frequently told us when she did not want us on top of the mountains by blowing us off of them. Um, so as we were creeping closer and closer to southern Maine, we were peering our way through the fog and searching for those white blazes through the mist of, you know, you could see five feet of visibility and see some of the cairns, and we were climbing up and up and up and up. And I mean, these are steep climbs. Maine is so steep, so treacherous, and so stunning all at the same time. So these are just examples of how steep it was, you know, using some uh, rebar and whatnot, some of the views. Finally, we reached southern Maine. Um, I do have to say that Mother Nature tried to throw me down the mountain once. Um, the winds blew up suddenly and kind of threw me into a rock. And I actually fell sideways into the rock because of the wind, and then another one came up behind me and threw me forward and tried to send me sailing down the mountain, which I did not do, luckily. But um, on top of it, as I'm dealing with all of this, before we get into southern Maine, um, only a couple hundred miles into the trail, my boots started to disintegrate. So the treads on the bottom of the boots were actually peeling off the bottom of the boots. I'm going to repeat that. This is a couple hundred miles into the trail. You're supposed to go through three pairs of boots max through the entire Appalachian Trail. I'm a couple hundred in, I'm already in trouble. On top of it, the stitching on the side of the boots was starting to come undone. So I got my boots from LLB. I gave them a call on the side of the mountain in Maine. I'm sitting on the trail on the phone with LB. And I said to them, yeah, I'm a through hiker and this is my problem. And they said, oh, no problem. You know, what do you got? We'll send you a new pair. Oh. Excellent. You know, so they shipped me a new pair because I give LLB all the credit in the world. They back their gear up like there's no tomorrow. If you want a good company, go to them. I am not sponsored by them. I just support them fully. Um, but they did send me three pairs of boots the whole way as long as that pair of boots like work for me, which eventually it didn't. But um, it did continue to disintegrate. I can share with you what brand it was, but not right now. Um, but they did send me a new pair every single time. So Southern Maine um, starts, well it doesn't really start off, but one of the hardest parts in Southern Maine is Mapusik Notch. It is, all, it is known on the Appalachian Trail, it actually says it in the guidebook, as one of the most hated or most enjoyed parts of the Appalachian Trail. For me it was the most enjoyed. Um, Mahusik Notch is a giant rock boulder field that um, takes, it's about one mile of trail, and it takes anyone ever, anywhere from about a mile, or a, an hour and a half to four hours to get through. One mile. It's just giant rock boulders up and down, over and under. Um, this is actually the entrance into it, and it's me and my trailmate looking up at two other hikers from inside the cave. Um, I actually had to remove my pack three times just to get through sections because it was so narrow. I mean, you're, you're crawling through caves, but it's fantastic. So we had an absolute field day in this section. Um, these are just some more pictures just to kind of give you an idea of what it was like. This is actually one of the caves. You can barely see my trail mate coming out right there. That was one of the ones I had to take my pack off for. Yeah, I had to take it off and kind of like scurry it through underneath the whole way. <laughs> and this is one of the girls I was thinking was passed out on a rock because she was tired from that section. We did finally make it through that, and then um, the next day, we were going to be leaving Maine. So, we came across a lot of challenges in Maine. Fording rivers, ferrying across rivers, climbing ladders, climbing rebar, sliding down mountains, and depending on our bouldering skills. Um, this is also where I got my trail name, Dory. So a lot of times I'd be crossing North Bounders, and they always said, oh, what's your trail name, what's your trail name? I, I don't know, short term, maybe? Short term? What, are you on the trail for a short period of time? What is that all about? <laughs> well, you know, I have memory problems, I'd say. And they go, oh, okay. <laughs> so one day, these two North Bounders, Ron, John, and Oso, were their trail names. Ah, what's your trail name? Ah, I don't know, it might be short term. Short term? Okay, we're going through the same conversation here. I was like, oh, I don't have memory problems. And they go, no, your trail name has to be Dory. Like the fish from Finding Nemo that can't remember anything? <laughs> yep, that was it. That'll work. <laughs> so that's how I got the trail name. So into New Hampshire, we, um, 
I thought I escaped me with, you know, just a couple bruised egos when I slipped and fell on like it. But um, the first day coming into New Hampshire, I, I broke camp before anyone else that I was hiking with, so I actually got back to the trail. Like, sometimes you walk a little bit off trail to get to the places that you stay at. So I was coming back down the trail, and I walk not even like a quarter mile down the trail, and I come up to a rock wall. How on earth am I going to get up this? The first handhold's above me. So I had to jump to get to the first handhold. And as I'm pulling myself up, this is with a 55 pound pack, mind you. As I'm pulling myself up, wham! Elbow right into a rock. So, main clamp my elbow. <laughs> didn't, not, didn't make it out safe. But I did make it out. So into New Hampshire. Now, New Hampshire were my playing grounds as a kid. Like I said, I grew up hiking the way to Mount Washington. So I knew this area very, very, very well. Um, Mount, Mount Madison, Mount Washington, and Moose Lock Mountain were probably the three key points in New Hampshire that I want to talk about today. So, the Whites. That's a shot of the Whites from across the way. They welcomed me home by being in the clouds. It was very nice of them. This is what I grew up knowing as a child. Madison, uh, the tricky thing about the Whites is um, there's not too many opportunities to camp out. You're kind of forced to work around the hut system, for those of you that are aware of the hut system. These are um, closed uh, buildings that are actually quite nice. I do highly recommend you check them out at some point in time. But typically, guests, guests will pay $100 plus to spend a night there. Now, you would expect some luxury. Now, you're in bunk rooms with lots of other people, which is fine. It's great. It's a wonderful atmosphere. I, again, I grew up doing it. It's fantastic. But as a through hiker, you don't have $100 to spend a night somewhere. So what they do for the through hikers is you can do what's called a work for stay. Um, some of the huts will let you stay for free, and you can do little tasks, and you get a little floor space, and that's, that's what you do. Um, the problem is, there's so many makers that come in and out of there, they usually only accept a couple. So you, timing things is very difficult, and it's kind of like a free-for-all, trying to get to these huts. It's not uncommon to find hikers just hanging out like a mile before the hut, waiting for the right time to get there to get that work for stay. But we were able to get a couple work for stays. So going up Mount Madison, um, again, this is the area I knew very well. So we started at Pickham Notch, again, for anybody that's familiar with the area. Um, and our game plan was we were going to treat ourselves. We were going to stay at Madison Hut as guests. The next day, because Mount Madison is a nightmare to get up, by the way. Um, the next day, we would go across Mount Washington and try to do a work for stay at Lake in the Clouds, which is a really famous hut in that area. Problem was, we get to the base of Madison and we find out that Lakes in the Clouds is closed, which in my history has never really happened. Turns out they had a little bit of a bed bug scare, so they closed down. And it just so happened to be the night that we were going to be coming through. So plans had to change. We, uh, we quickly rerouted and we said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go up, we're going to stay at Madison, we're going to go across to Washington, take the shuttle down to Joe Dodge Lodge, and then go back up the next day and continue on our way. And that's what we did. I do have to say, going across Mount Washington was just like I remember. And the cause bad weather windy. So we made our way across, and we are the only two hikers on the trail that day, I have to add. And it didn't start off too bad. We're going across the mountains, and um, as soon as we cross over Mount Washington, the winds kicked up. And we're getting pelted in the side of the face with what we thought was rain. Or hail. We're not really sure which. And at some point in time, I actually turned to my trail mate and thought to myself, maybe we need to hunker down somewhere. This is getting pretty bad. So my mantra for the remainder of that day was, please let us get to Mount Washington safely. Please let us get to Mount Washington safely. Every step, please let us get to Mount Washington safely. And we just trudged one step after the next. Um, if anyone doesn't know this, Mount Washington has a train called the Cog Rail that goes up it. And it's, it's a really wild, Wow, train, I, I again recommend you check it out, but I'm getting closer and I start to hear this train I'm like, oh, we're almost there. But the problem is, is the wind's whipping the sound all over the place, so we have no idea where it's coming from. I, I suspect it's ahead of me, but I don't know how far. And then finally it emerges to fog. Like, oh, I'm almost there. So we continue along our way, and um, you know, as eventually the climb flattens out. And now I know there's there's buildings on the top of Mount Washington, but I see none of them. And I've heard stories of people literally walking into the side of the building. So I'm on the top of Mount Washington like this. Just hoping I'm not one of those people. 
So we did eventually make it up, and we got our little picture at the top of Mount Washington, shuttled back down. The remainder of our journey through New Hampshire was actually in fairly good weather. So, let's see here. My boots continue to disintegrate as I traverse this beautiful and very challenging terrain. Um, here we go. There's the treads ripping off the bottom of them. Here's the stitching blowing out the side of them. I barely made it with the boots that I had to where I was. Maine and New Hampshire are not places that you want to slip and slide. I was slipping and sliding in these in dry conditions. My feet were coming right out from underneath me in scenarios where I was going to slide off of the boulder. So very, very dangerous, but I was happy to say that I made it through. We went through Franconia Ridge, which is a section of um, the Whites on Labor Day. And one of the rangers told us that there were 800 plus people on the top of that mountain that day. We were the only two going the direction we were going that day. So every single time we were going across that ridge, we had to wait for endless lines of people to come past us. So it was, it was quite amazing um, how many people went through there. You know, every once in a while we'd get like a little break in the, break in the track and we'd run right through and then we'd wait for the next one. So as we were making our way down the whites, um, because of the weight we were carrying in our packs and the terrain itself, it's so steep, it's so, it's so steep, it's so rocky. Um, like I said, me claimed my elbow, and the Hampshire claimed my knees. We got to the bottom of this mountain, and actually this exact water source, our knees would take no more. So we threw our packs down and walked right into that water source and iced our knees down because it was that cold. We just sat there knee high until we couldn't feel our feet anymore, and then we continued on our way. Uh, Musilak Mountain was, I would say, probably one of the last challenges in New Hampshire. Um, it's a really steep section of trail, but it's actually quite enjoyable. It's not, not, it's not nearly as bad as me, so it really wasn't too bad. Um, it's pretty much filled with areas like this where you're just walking up rocks and it's just one step after the next. And of course, as we're coming down the other side of Musilak Mountain, Mother Nature, Mother Nature graced us again with fog and high winds, so we didn't really hang out on the top of that mountain for too long. But it was here that I learned why the Northbounders have been complaining about the rocks so much. So, once you get out of New Hampshire, it's like, I don't want to say it's smooth sailing, but compared to Maine and, and uh, New Hampshire, it's smooth sailing. <laughs> so, my whole life I grew up hiking in New Hampshire with the rocks. That's what I thought the Appalachian Trail was. So when I heard the Northbounders say, oh my gosh, these rocks, oh my gosh, these rocks. So I kept thinking to myself, what, what, you, I don't, what did you think? What did you think you were going to get? So once we got into Vermont, it was like we got shot out of a cannon. <laughs> we were doing anywhere from, I would say, 6 to 12 miles a day through Maine and New Hampshire, depending on which part you were in. When we got to Vermont, we started hitting 15 and up, because it was just, it was so, so much nicer than New Hampshire. The leaves slowly started to change at this point in time, and the, color, the fall color started to come in, the temperature started to drop. At night, we were starting to get to the point that having a fire was something that was essential and necessary. Um, but the terrain was tremendous, just improved tremendously. I did get to see my first bear in uh, Vermont. It was a huge, one of the biggest bears I've ever seen. Um, didn't have any problems with him after hollering. He just kind of ran off and did his own thing. Um, we found ourselves walking through fields, uh, walking through forest areas. Um, walking through uh, nice wooded, open paths. And it was at this point in time one night that I was setting up my tent and I set up my rain fly and everything's all set ready to go and all of a sudden, snap! Whoa! Ripped the rain fly off. What was that? My tent pole snapped and popped a hole in my rain fly. So I went, hmm, what am I going to do for tonight? Luckily my trail mate was nice enough to let me sleep in her tent with her. So for the next, next couple weeks, I either stayed in shelters, which were not as bad now that I was at me, or I was in the tent with her. But this was just one of the few things to come that was in Vermont. So not long after that, I was walking along and I ended up rolling my ankle. Now, this is not really a big deal for me because you know, I grew up playing sports and rolled my ankle so many times that the ligaments are essentially worthless. So, which is good for me right now. Um, I could essentially stand on the side of my feet and not have pain. So when I rolled my ankle, all right, no big deal. Except I rolled it so hard, and my pack weight flipped me forward, and in order to not die head first from the ground, because let's say Dory does not need another concussion, I tucked and rolled and flipped sideways like a turtle, 
over my back. I sat, sprawled out, you know, nursing my ego, and uh, assessed the scenario and was fine. Shortly after that, however, I woke up one morning with a sinus infection. Awesome. I'm in the middle of the woods. Now, sinus infection doesn't sound like too bad, but for me, it hits me pretty hard. So we're making our way up this trail, and I'm just plodding one foot in front of the other. Finally, we get to this part, point, and I just drop pack and throw my feet up. Well, my trail may thought it would be a nice opportunity to take a picture of her kill. <laughs> so, I boogied it to town. We weren't going to go to town that day, I boogied it to town. As soon as I got to town, I drank a gallon of orange juice and I had myself a nice bottle of night and took a zero in town. It was in Vermont that we crossed the 500 mile mark, our quarter way mark. We had 11 states left to go. So that was pretty exciting. You know, some way you survive on the Appalachian Trail is by exciting or uh, celebrating all those little, those little achievements, all those little steps. So on to Massachusetts. This is where my best friend comes in. I don't know if she knows she's in this. About to find out. So my best friend joined us for this section in Massachusetts, which was awesome. So what we ended up doing was, we actually became flip-floppers for a little bit. We, because uh, we had her car and we had a good friend of mine that drove us as well. He dropped us off south, and we hiked back north to her car, which confused all the other hikers I had been with at that point. When all of a sudden, wait, Dory, where, where, which way are you going? <laughs> it was in Massachusetts that we reached the highest point, which is Mount Greylock. Unfortunately, Mother Nature did not cooperate again, and I did not have any really good pictures of Mount Greylock. Um, it was pretty much in the clouds, and it was cold and rainy and windy. No pictures of that. Um, this is my best friend making it up that section, so there were still some steep sections coming in in uh, Massachusetts. Not too bad, though. Makes it fun. Makes it interesting. Um, the Long Trail also meets up with the Appalachian Trail in Massachusetts, and I understand some of you have are witness to that. Um, as an Appalachian Trail through hiker, you hike 105 miles of the Long Trail. The Long Trail runs the length of Vermont. It's about 275 miles total, so I've already done 105, so at some point I'm going back to finish that. I don't know when that's going to be. But uh, my friend Jess did get to do sections of that with us as well. We were very excited to be back in Vermont. Wait a minute, we have to finish another state. Why are we back in Vermont? So after Jess joined us for that little bit, then we drove back to where we had started and we did our little flip-flop and we continued on south. Um, we parted ways with Jess. She dropped us off, bid us farewell, and off we went. Um, I want to take a moment to talk about one of the shelters that we stopped at, this Upper Goose Pond Shelter. This is actually a view from Upper Goose Pond Shelter. Now, as a through hiker, rarely do you go more than 0.2 miles off trail to stay a night anywhere. It's kind of funny because you walk 2,200 miles, but God forbid you walk 0.3 miles off trail. Nope, can't do that. That's too far. But Upper Goose Pond Shelter is 0.5 miles off trail. <laughs> No, I'm not doing it. Except they have bunks. They have food. Woo, now you're talking. They serve pancakes and coffee in the morning. So <laughs> off we went. So as a through hiker, this is me enjoying my snacks by the way. Um, food is big with a through hiker. That's that's pretty much like the winner right there. So if you ever get the chance, check out Upper Goose Pond Shelter. It's a really, really awesome place. There were so many adventures in Massachusetts. The last one was, this sounds crazy, but we got to cross Route 90. Woohoo! <laughs> I had driven underneath this bridge months before, so this was, this was epic for me. This was the big mile marker. Again, like I said, as a through hiker, to keep going, you celebrate all those little, little achievements. If all you do is think about, oh, I just made it through this state, I made it through that state, that's it, you're going to have a hard time. So we started by celebrating every 100 miles, every 200 miles, every 300 miles, the quarterway mark, the halfway mark. We left this state, we crossed that, that huge landmark. This is one of those landmarks. Um, right after this, we uh, caught wind that there was a little bit of trail magic hmm, coming up, so we rushed it to this trail magic location. Now what's trail magic? Unexpected act of kindness. It's essentially usually provided by a trail agent. This could be anything from the water that's left on the side of the road, to what this was. This was actually a um, shed that was filled with books, uh, sodas. You could purchase a soda. Woo! It's like gold through hiker again. Um, you had somewhere you can charge your electronics. That's 
huge too. And you can throw your trash out. That's fantastic. You know, as a film maker, you know, pack in, pack out. We never leave anything on the trail. Whatever we bring with us comes out with us. So that means all the trash that we have, we're carrying. And every ounce counts out there. This is coming from someone that carried way too much weight on the Appalachian Trail. Um, so being able to throw out your, your garbage is huge. So this was absolutely fantastic. So the remainder of our journey through Massachusetts, we encountered a porcupine from a distance, don't worry. But it was my first time seeing a porcupine. By the way, they will steal your boots, FYI. Um, they are little critters that like salt, so they will come frequently eat away at the shelters, and the, that's why they steal boots. They'll actually lick the salt out of your boot and sometimes walk away with them. So be careful with that one. Um, this is also where we encounter the drought. So the year that I took the Appalachian Trail was, like I said, one of the hardest ones for shop founders. The drought at this time ran from Massachusetts to Virginia. As I, and I mean, this was a pretty significant drought. Um, as I would continue along my journey, that drought would push all the way down to Georgia. So the water sources that were usually reliable were not. So trail angels were leaving jugs of water like those at the road crossing for, th for three hikers, which helped us along the way tremendously. I'm going to stop for a second and talk about this. This helped us out tremendously, too. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the Gut Hooks app. They have one for the Appalachian Trail, they have one for the Pacific Crest Trail. It would be fantastic to see something like this show up for other long trails as well. Pretty much what this is, is it shows you the different locations you're going to come across, the, uh, the shelters, the water sources, land, different landmarks, and when I give you information on it. Well, what's even more important and what got us through the drought is the water source of our park. Not only does it tell you about those sources, but people that use the app can actually comment on the sources with a date. So the people that were ahead of us were saying, this source is dry, this source is dirty, this is running, this is not running. That's how we get through. So if you, you know, I don't know what's out there for some of the other trails, but this is huge. So if anyone ever comes up with something for the longer trails, that was a lifesaver for us. So on to Connecticut. Step number one was the highest point in Connecticut. Um, which, is, which is Bear Mountain. Um, Connecticut was one of the shorter states. It was only 43 miles. Uh, we didn't really get to spend too much time in there, but we did cross our 1,500 mile to go mark. Like I said, this is, this is a big one. That sounds daunting, but that means we had 700 miles behind us at this point. So that was, that was pretty exciting for us at that point. Um, at this point, the temperature started to drop. Um, during the day, it was about 50 degrees, which in my opinion is actually a perfect hiking condition. Um, every single night we were, and then morning I should say, great horned owls were waking us, or greeting us, which was nice. Um, and a couple of interesting sections in Connecticut were John's Ledges and the Lemon Squeeze. So John's Ledges, we heard about from the North Mounders. Now this is also where we learned to take things with a grain of salt. So, up until this point, a North Mounder has an encounter in New Hampshire or Maine. So we learned to them what was steep was not Maine. So the whole time we're heading down south, whenever we heard, oh my gosh, this section's so steep, at first we're like, oh, I thought I was done with this. And we get up there, oh, it's not that bad. You know, not that it was easy at all, but it was not southern Maine. That was something we said the whole rest of the journey. It was not southern Maine. The Lemon Squeeze was a really interesting section of the trail. There's actually two of them on the trail. They might have my pictures confused here, but it's a very narrow section of trail where I have a hard time getting through it, but why? So I had to take my pack off and scurry through it sideways. So as I'm scurrying through this, I get down to the other part and I'm having fun, this is great. I get down to the bottom, my trailmate goes down around an easier way. <laughs> it's kind of how that whole trail went for me. <laughs> I took the fun way. All right, New York. Now, you guys are in New York. I'm sure you're willing to hear about New York. You want to know all about New York. I'm going to bust your bubble a little bit. New York is awesome for day hiking, section hiking, weekend hiking. It's beautiful. It is one of the most frustrating sections, in my opinion, as a through hiker. And I'm going to explain why. So at first, smooth sailing. You know, you cross a section where you can actually go to a train and take a train into New York City if you want. Something we didn't choose to do, but that's actually quite interesting. Starts off, you know, a little board walking, you know, no big deal, no problem. 
What was awesome about New York was this is where fall caught us. What I mean by that is we had been riding the fall tide up until that point. When we started, fall slowly started to merge onto us like a wave. And then suddenly it caught up with us, and suddenly it passed us by and left us with sticks. But in the meantime, this was where it caught up with us, and it was stunning. So one of the first things you come across in your estate is Bear Mountain. You walk across this bridge, and you enter into a zoo, actually. Um, and this is funny. It's called the Trailside Museum and Zoo. So here we are as three hikers. We have our packs. We stink. Let's be real. We're dirty. We're filthy. We've definitely dropped a lot of weight at this point. And we're walking through the zoo, and there's all these little signs that tell all the visiting zoo people that there's, you know, Appalachian Trail, and what is that? A thrill hiker, what is that? And look, wild thrill hikers are making their way through the zoo right now! So all these kids are like, oh, oh, there's like hordes of kids running around looking at us. Now I feel like an exhibit more than I did going through there. <laughs> at the, at the interesting thing is, in this zoo is the lowest elevation point on the Appalachian Trail. And it's at the Bears Den. There we go. Right after that, oh boy, this is where my sanity started to fail as far as near estate was concerned. Right after that, you go up uh, Bear Mountain. Very nice mountain, very populated mountain. It was also at this point, to be honest, about 80, 90 degrees, and we were sweltering again. So I'm sure that didn't help with the mental break on my part. But what was nice is after we exited the zoo, you know, you're starting up Bear Mountain. Again, there's more stuff. They actually, they actually have a section where you can walk on different parts that an Appalachian Trail through hiker walks on, which is really quite fascinating. So as we're making our way up to the top of Bear Mountain, people are stepping aside and clapping, watching us go up. Wow. So we get up to the top of Bear Mountain, and you know, we start realizing we're zigging and we're zagging all over the place. Why? I look at my map. I think they're trying to send messages to the guys. We cut a cut. We, I gotta show this. We cut a cut right across here. We didn't have to do all this. So, you know, okay, that's a little frustrating, you know. So then, we continue along our way, and we get to experience the Palisades Parkway. Now, most of the time you have a road crossing, it's either via a bridge or it's via a tunnel. There is neither on this section. People have to, through hikers, have to cross this road. Mind you, there are lots of drivers that do anywhere from about 55 to 80 miles an hour, and that's me being generous, through this area. We got there at 5.30 p.m. <laughs> we had to cross the Palisades Parkway like deer, with full hacks, like the game Frogger, if any of you know that. So we're standing on the side of the road, it is so hot out. I am, you know, we're getting honked at, yeah, that's helpful, thank you. Waiting for a break in this road. Finally, we got our break and we sprint across the first section. And we get into that nice little woodsy area on the side, we gotta do it again. I had a half a mind to set up my tent right there for the night and just wait. So we made it safely across the Palisades Parkway, I am happy to say. Um, I, at this point, was rather frustrated. So we get up to the end of New York State, which now this is where I said, as a section of weekend hanger, New York State's really beautiful, really. But at this point, I've had enough. <laughs> so we get up to these sections that are super, super jagged. Like, if you fall, you are going to hurt yourself badly, because they're so sharp. And we're, you know, the trail essentially at this point goes straight to the left, up over a little ridge to the right. Straight to the left, up over a ridge to the right. And you're doing this for months, back and forth. Why? It's the same thing. You get up to the top and you're like, wow, this is really stunning. And you look to your right, there's a tiny little dirt path that went around that little mountain that you did not see a minute ago. Ugh. So you get down, you do it again. Same thing, same view. You look to your right, tiny little dirt path you didn't see. So we start catching on to this, because you know we've had it off at this point. Beautiful view, yeah, we've seen it for done. And uh, we take one of these little side paths and it starts peeling off the wrong direction. That would not go around. So with our tail between our legs, we turn and go back, back up the trail and go back and just continue along our way. And that was New York. We were done. So into New Jersey. New Jersey started off with another lemon to be, part two. 
Um, just it, these are really fun sections for me to be honest with you. And then we encountered the guardian. This is creepy to walk up on in the middle of the woods when it's close to dusk. I don't know why it's there, but it was known as the guardian on the trail. And I know a couple through hikers that took took little two beady eyes and stuck on it there too, so for entertainment's sake. Um, but in New Jersey, you cross something that we call the boardwalk. The boardwalk is a long section of trail. It's all it's like all wooden planks. This is like a highway to a highway, unless it rains, and then it turns into a slip and slide. And you spend more time slipping and falling than you do walking and trying to make your way. But it's a it's it's a really nice section. We actually got lucky. It wasn't too bad when we came through there. So it was in New Jersey. The temperature starts to drop a little bit further. Um, I thought the sleep system that I had to do the trick. So I had a sleeping bag rated for 35 degrees. Okay, that's kind of warm. But then I had a sleeping bag liner that was rated for 10, so that would give me an extra 10 degrees. That means I can sleep in 25 degrees. Okay, so that should cover it. Not to mention I've got clothes I can wear and layers I can put on. So I thought I was going to be okay. Later on I would find out that was not the case. So it was actually one morning we woke up and everything was covered in a thin layer of ice. Um, this was actually the day that we were trying to make it down um, into the Delaware Water Gap. But um, it was in New Jersey that I discovered it was actually going to be warmer to stay in the shelters than it would for me to stay in my tent. So on those really cold nights, I stayed in the shelters. This is the thin layer of ice covering everything as we were going down the trail. That was wild, by the way. Things hung a lot lower than usual, and you're like crunching all the way through the trail. And it was, it was really actually quite beautiful. So Delaware Water Gap. This is Sunfish Pond. So um, we came down, it was miserable weather, we came flying down the mountain, but this was our entrance into Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is dubbed Rocksylvania by the through hot hikers. Um, and we're not talking rocks like the boulders in Maine. We're talking about old, like little tiny rocky boulder fields. This is the trip. See the little white blades? That's the trip. And no step you take is a secure step. You're constantly wobbling your ankles the whole way. And you turn into this little kind of bobble thing as you're going down the trail. This is where you develop blisters you never thought were possible. That is a blister I developed underneath a callus. I did not know you could do that. I found out you can. Um, it took a couple of minor surgeries for me to uh, fix that. I don't mean literally going to the hospital, I mean me doing the minor surgery. <laughs> um, but this is another section that's part of Rocksylvania, which is known as Lehigh Gap. Very, very steep section, very beautiful section. Um, kind of reminded us of Southern Maine a little bit as we made our way down. Yet in the challenge, oh, there's also some um, nice edge kind of stuff, which is what that picture is right there. They're very narrow sections that you can kind of fall either way, but they're very awesome. There also remains a lot of beauty Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a pretty big state, and uh, the shelters are pretty awesome there. They're very different. So this is one of the shelters called the 501 shelter. It's totally enclosed, very rare to find on the Appalachian Trail. We were lucky enough to be the only two in there that day. Um, we also encountered some uh, multi-level shelters, which is this is one of them. Um, yeah, and then my favorite, which is the Quarry Gap shelter. Very stunning. We got our own rooms that night. That was awesome. Pennsylvania is where we had our 1,000 mile to go marker. We are almost halfway there. These are two little critters that I carried with me the entire trail. Almost every single hiker has something like this that they carry. After Rocksylvania, we made it through rolling farmlands, some forest lands, cow pastures, rocks. We meandered this way and that way until we finally reached the halfway point of the Appalachian Trail, the actual halfway point. So this was another epic kind of spot that we crossed. Now into Maryland. Mar Thanksgiving was only a couple days away, and before we knew it, we'd be in Harper Square, West Virginia, which is the psychological halfway point of the Appalachian Trail. We spent three days in Maryland and one day in West Virginia, and then we were right into Virginia. So we did a little slack packing. Now slack packing is when you leave most of your gear at a location, someone drives you to a separate location, and you hike back to that location with a lot less gear. You can cover some high mileage doing this, um, and it gives you warm bed to stay in, which at this point in time was huge because the weather was starting to drop down to 20s or below at night. So having somewhere to stay inside was, was big. My trail mate 
really is the poster child for slack packing. She put like two things in her raincoat and threw it over her shoulder. She's the definition of slack packing. I was not that good at it. I had my pack, and I, you know, I'm a physical therapist. I have to have my first aid kit. I need to, you know, I didn't do so well with it. There's a lot of history in Maryland and in West Virginia, though. So everywhere you turn, there's another battle scene, there's another landmark, um, another ruined building. It's, it's quite amazing, actually. Very, very, very awesome. So then we entered into West Virginia. I had been dreaming of walking across this bridge my whole life. This was the psychological halfway point. And, you know, there's tourists all over the place, and then here I come across the bridge, obviously through hiking at this point. Tears down my face, and I just made my way through this town. And uh, got to the Appalachian Trail Conservancy headquarters. Um, they do their best to try to keep track of how many hikers hike every single year. So if you go there, they can tell you what number of hiker you are as far as southbound or northbound or flip flop or whatever is concerned. So remember, I said five or six hundred southbounders started that year. I was number 251 to reach this point. There were maybe five or six Southbounders behind me. That was at the year. So that shows you how many people drop before they reach this point. The next day we cross the bridge and we're into West Virginia. Um, I'm sorry, Virginia, not West Virginia. We already went to West Virginia. Um, Virginia is about a quarter of the trail. Huge state. A lot of people call this the Virginia Blues. Now, remember before I said, if you think about going through state by state by state, you're going to have a hard time. So what we did was we broke it into four sections, starting with the Shenandoah National Park. This is where I saw most of the bear, actually. Um, usually for through hikers this time of year, it's also known as the Green Tunnel because there's just greens everywhere. You can see nothing. Luckily for us, it was more like walking through a bunch of matchsticks, so we can see it really, really well. So this is where the temperatures plummeted. Um, overnight, it would freeze so quickly that as we were walking, it would be crunching and sinking in about one inch because the, the ice would expand. So every step you took, you were sinking down into the ground by an inch. So it was really, that was kind of interesting, actually. Um, this is, and then if it rained, it was even colder. So this is my chow mate and someone else that I ended up hiking with along the way. Um, like I said, there were also a lot of fires this year, so we did walk through a lot of areas. Gatlinburg, this was the year Gatlinburg happened. So we walked through a lot of fires um, through that area as well. Our next challenge was the Blue Ridge Mountains. And, uh, you know, at this point in time, the temperatures are continuing to drop, and I'm thinking to myself, it's okay, we're in Virginia, just gotta keep going, we're gonna outrun this cold. Wrong. Um, we got down to, all said and done, negative two, negative three degrees, during the day. So the problem we were encountering at this point was how do you stay warm enough to survive yet not so warm that you get wet from sweat and then freeze when you stop? So what was happening is we weren't stopping for snack breaks. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I dropped down to my high school weight when I was on the trail because you're burning through so many calories. So eating food is huge. You have to keep the calories in. So not stopping for those snack breaks was becoming detrimental to us because we were starting to shed the weight to the point that we were getting into red zones again. So we were having some problems with that. This, is the, this was what was left of the Southbounders at this point in time. So um, I got into this town called Waynesboro, Virginia, and there were nights that the hikers around me were shivering and whimpering through the night, and I was barely making it myself. My sleep system wasn't quite good anymore. So I'm watching my dream of being a through hiker disintegrate in front of my eyes. So I, I had to make the call. I, I called my mom, who was sitting right here in the front row. Tears in my eyes, thinking I was gonna end. And she bailed me out. I ended up getting a sleeping bag that was 15 degrees because of her. And I was able to keep going. So the 15 degree bag couldn't do the trick. Um, I couldn't thank her enough for that. So we continued to walk our way. We did get caught in a snowstorm, I have to say. But we were lucky enough to meet a really awesome trail angel who told us about a resort that we could stay at. So we waded out the snow from this nice resort and actually watched Lord of the Rings while we were there. 
which was perfect, I have to say. So as we continued along, um, I'm sad to say that at this point, um, we were getting into Buena Vista, Virginia, and my trail, this is how cold it was. So someone was joking around before about thinking that it was Appalachian Trail images before. They weren't too far from the truth. Um, in Buena Vista, this was the last of the southbounders for the year. And my trail mate and one other of the southbounders decided they couldn't handle the cold anymore, and they were getting off trail. So it was at this point I said goodbye to my, my trail mate, unfortunately, and um, me and two other hikers continued on. So now there's three of us left in Southern Virginia. And we're not seeing day hikers, we're not seeing weekend hikers, we're seeing nobody but each other. And uh, one of those three was finishing her flip-flop bike soon, so she was going to be getting off trail. The other one was going to be getting off trail right after Daleville, Virginia, which meant I would have been the last man standing. At this point in time, I thought to myself, I can, I'm not seeing anybody. If something happens, I'm in trouble. Like, normally speaking, if you're alone out there, it's okay because there's someone else that's going to be on the trail, not in this scenario. So I had to make a tough call, and this is where Act 2 comes in. Um, you know, we, we, I made up my mind in two days' time period. I had a game plan. I had an idea to come back. I, had, I, I was going to be back in March. So this was one of the last days that we hiked together, and then we all bid farewell at the airport as we said goodbye to each other. And thus, Act 2 begins. So Act 2 consists of the rest of Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia. So on day one, I wasn't planning on doing the mileage that I did, but I started off doing 15 miles on day one because I crossed some rather unsavory characters and did not want to stay with them. So I booked it to the next shelter. Uh, mind you, at this point in time, I'm now a solo hiker. There, I'm not with anybody else. There's other self that did the same thing as me and came back out, but there were a couple things behind me. So I knew they'd catch up eventually, but for now I was alone. So I got to the shelter and there was another self there, and he had just started that year. He's a southbound flip flopper, so I had someone to hike with for a couple of days. Day two, I crossed McAfee Knob, another huge epic point on the Appalachian Trail, which is what that is right there. Followed quickly by a place called Dragon's Tooth. That's the trail. You go up that, very steep, very beautiful. That's another shot of Dragon's Tooth right there, actually. So then, um, day three I had to take a zero because I was doing such high mileage, I actually developed blisters underneath the bottoms of both heels. So while I'm licking my wounds in this wonderful hostel that kind of emerged before me, all of a sudden in walks a familiar face, a kid that I had hiked with in Massachusetts, who had also gotten off trail and come back on, and neither one of us knew that. I was so happy to see a familiar face, I jumped up and gave him a big hug. And uh, his trail name was Gap, and I would endearingly call him my trail son because he was 19. And I'm 34, for those that don't know. So in order for not to not get some weird looks from people, I called him my trail son. Um, but we ended up hiking together for a couple a couple months, the remainder of their journey pretty much. Um, so we thought we escaped the bad weather by taking the months off, and we were wrong. It did snow again on us, um, and we ended up taking some zeros at some shelters. This is also where I caught poison sumac. Yeah, yeah. Um, it covered my entire body, and I got rescued off trail by a trail angel that owned the hostel. She took me to urgent care, and I had a steroid shot, steroid pills, and an ointment to try to take this out. So I took four zeros with her, and I'm very grateful that she took me in. That was not fun. But then right after that, we got into the Grayson Highlands. The Grayson Highlands are a really awesome place because of the wild ponies. Now, we heard about these wild ponies, and we know that they're friendly with hikers. We did not realize they would be this friendly. <laughs> so there's actually a shelter where they will come right up to the shelter. We have been tipped off not to leave your gear on the bottom level because it will be eaten or stolen. They are self-deficient and are craving salt and are known to destroy hikers' equipment. So we stayed on the second story and just enjoyed the gathering of the wild ponies. This is also where we crossed the 500 miles to go park. We only had 500 miles left. That was it. I, it's, again, it sounds huge, but in the, the lifetime of through maker, it's so little. And then we made it into the Rowan Highlands. This is where I kind of got parted from my, my trail son for a little while. 
Um, he couldn't quite keep up with the mileage, and I, I kept kind of losing him behind me. And I had to take a zero out of shelter because the winds were so bad at one point in time. Um, and we were going over the last of the Bald Mountains on the, on the Appalachian Trail. But um, this is also where I started crossing a lot of northbounders today. Because now the next week, the northbounders are starting up. And uh, I mean, we're talking like 40 to 80 northbounders on crossing each day. And word of mouth travels really well on the trail. So all these northbounders had heard about these legendary southbounders that were still out there from last year. <laughs> Bullshit. 
me not 30 feet away, and I had no idea. Up that tree were her three cubs. I don't know if you can see them, the little black spots. So, oh, 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 come on. Ah, well, that right there, that little flash of green light, that's Mama Bear. The three are up on the right hand side, but this is not working now. Oh, there we go. Boom, boom, and boom. There's Mama. Yeah. You ever seen a bear bulge before? It's scary. So we get into Georgia, the last and final state. Um, you're really not in Georgia for too long. Um, I did get to meet up with a couple other Southbounders that I had to cross paths with. Uh, Southbounders are crazy, just so I know. But, um, I did have to part ways with them because they as well were not doing the mileage that I had to do, which was which was sad. But um, I was lucky enough to um, end my trail with uh, a girl that had been looking for me as well. Three days before I finished my journey, I found my first rattlesnake. <laughs> um, word of mouth, like I said, travels well, so I knew where this rattlesnake was going to be before I got to it, and I mean exactly. This person that told me the rattlesnake was coming pointed it out on the map. So I am crawling down the trail, because at this point in time, the trail is very narrow. This picture doesn't really do it justice, but that's about how narrow the trail was, and on either side were greens that were about mid shin height. And they're thick. And rattlesnakes are known to be found right on the edge of trails. I was not going to see this thing coming, so I am really going slow through this area. And I start to hear like a swarm of locusts. What on earth is this? And then I see two women, not on trail, in the woods, making their way. Is there a rattlesnake over there? Yeah, it's right there. Okay. So I'm so glad I saw those women because I'm not convinced I would have known that swarm of locusts was the ticked off rattlesnake warning me to stay away. I, I did not sound like a rattle at all. I did not get a picture of this rattlesnake, but my trail son, I really hope there's no sound to this, my trail son did get a video of one crossing paths. So there she is. That's going across the trail. That's a rattlesnake. <laughs> I am happy I did not cross that. So, coming my last couple days, like I said, everybody was playing the Finding Dory game, and someone else found me. And it was a southbound flip flopper for that year that had seen me in the trail logs and had been chasing me for days and never caught me. Finally, she caught me. So I had warned her that. Um, you know, this was something that I had dreamt of my whole life, and it was something I was completing for my father as well. I was probably going to be emotional, for better or for worse, at the end of the trail. And I did not disappoint. <laughs> so here we go. 4.1 miles to go to the top of Springer. On June 1st, 2017, 9.20 a.m., I made my way through the trail into the opening where there's the plaque. And all I got tunnel vision. The only time in the whole trail I ever got tunnel vision. And there were people that were around that were starting their day hikes or whatever. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, I didn't even see them. I just went right for that plaque. And I just, I broke down. I dropped to my knees and was just bawling. For those of you that know me, I don't tend to show emotion. Um, so for me to bawl is pretty significant. Everyone around me is staring at me like, what on earth is she crying about? Until they finally realize what they are witnessing. Mind you, at this time of year, they're not expecting to see a southbound or complete a throughway. This is a very odd year. So when they finally realized what they were witnessing, everyone started hooting and hollering and cheering and celebrated with me. I called my dad on the trail, celebrated with him. It took me two hours before I can make my way down that mountain. Um, you know, it, something that's hard to talk about is I was out there for seven months. Seven months in one day. This was home. This was reality. At the top of this mountain, I was approached with the thought of, oh my god, I have to go back to society. <laughs> so, I'm not even sure I know what to do in there anymore. I got a shower. I got a bed. So, it, I was almost like mourning a friend. You know, it, it, it's surreal. Um, but after a couple hours, I finally was ready to make my way down. I had dreamed of walking through that archway, that approach trail archway, for years. And at this point, months, 
while I was in the woods. And finally, at 2 p.m. on the same day, the root of the and I went when my significant other waited for me on the other side. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. 